Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it is an honor to be here. Uh, my two colleagues have covered the case uh, very well uh, uh, and quite uh, uh, comprehensively. I will just address uh, some of the remaining issues uh, with a focus on uh, China's uh, perspectives and, and China's response to the arbitration case. Uh, first of all, let me just comment on the arbitration case itself, I'm, and, and I'll uh, focus on uh, a few selected issues here. Uh, first, non-appearance. Uh, this is the first case uh, in the previous 27 years uh, that a state resorted to whole-scale non-appearance in an international case since 1986, when the United States walked away from the Nicaragua case. Uh, the non-appearance decision by China turns out to be uh, a critical and irredeemable mistake. Uh, Chinese government, of course, would not acknowledge that, but I think it is quite clear that this is a disastrous decision that, that China has taken. I say it is irredeemable in two senses. First, in terms of China's domestic politics. Now, as we all know, that the, just like the Pope or the Donald, uh, the Chinese Communist Party uh, is infallible uh, on all matters uh, at all times, or so we are told. So that's one in one sense. In the other sense, in terms of this particular case, it actually doesn't make sense for you to walk back into the case once you have decided not to appear. Once you have decided not to appear, the arbitral tribunal is set up, because it doesn't matter if you don't appear, the arbitral tribunal will still be set up, the rules of procedure will still be drafted, mm -hmm. and the case will still go on. So once you make that initial mistake, you don't have any arbitrator in the tribunal, you don't have any input in the selection of other arbitrators, you don't have any input in the drafting of the rules of the arbitration. So obviously, you pass the point of no return when you made that initial mistake. You can't come back in. The nature of the tribunal and the process has been fundamentally altered by that decision. So I think, so I say this is an irredeemable mistake. It is also a legal ambush. By all accounts, and I've talked to many Chinese lawyers and foreign ministry people and, and, and so on. By all accounts, China had no advanced knowledge of what was coming. Now this is, in, in a way, it is amazing that, that that such an operation in the Philippines would not be picked up by the Chinese intelligence. We've been told that China is particularly good in cyber uh, espionage, but apparently nobody, well, maybe the intelligence picked it up and the leadership just ignored it. I, 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 we do not know. But I think it is quite clear that the Chinese did not know it was coming. And now that is, that I'm pretty sure, the Chinese academics, the Chinese government never studied this issue seriously. They never foresaw that it is possible for someone to bring a lawsuit against China even after China made the optional exclusion in 2006. China thought, well, we excluded the court's jurisdiction in those matters, so we are safe. But, so there was no warning, and, and, and the Chinese could rightly consider this to be, well, uh, just, I, I hope my uh, Japanese colleagues here would, uh, would forgive me, but this is like a legal Pearl Harbor. Uh, it was an ambush that, that the Chinese did not see coming. And there's a fleeting window of opportunity. Under the UNCLOS, once the notice of arbitration is filed, you have 30 days, you have one month to appoint <laughs> your arbitrator, which means that the Chinese government needs to make a decision in 30 days on what is the strength of our case in this matter, do we participate or not, if we should participate, who do we choose as, as arbitrator? Who will be our legal team? What will be our approach? You have to make all these decisions within 30 days. That's a lot of pressure. Non-appearance is a mistake, but it is a mistake that is easy to make in those 30 days. And as far as I know, the Chinese government did not consult extensively. It was, they, they did consult some of the leading international lawyers in China, but the decision was made in a hurry, within 30 days. And once it was made, it was irredeemable. You cannot walk away from it any, uh, anymore. So that brings to my last point. The case has a preordained outcome. Now, looking at the Philippines legal team, from their point of view, of course it is in your interest to make sure that the Chinese are as unprepared as they can. And that maximizes your chance of winning. But on the other hand, if your intention 
is to resolve the dispute rather than to create new problem, perhaps, I might suggest, wouldn't it be better for the Philippines to talk to the Chinese and, and, and give them forewarning and say, let's negotiate for the last time. Now, it's, 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 a, it's a controversial point whether they did negotiate about the matter. The Chinese said, we did not. The Philippines said, we did. And the tribunal agreed with the Philippines. Well, but wouldn't it be better for the Philippines to say to the Chinese, let's negotiate this matter for the last time. Otherwise, we are going to bring the case against you. I mean, if you give forewarning to the Chinese, let them prepare the case, wouldn't you have a better chance of compliance with the decision? Well, maybe not. Maybe the Chinese would still decide not to appear and not to comply. And of course, it's, we, we do not know about that. But you would think that the Philippines, by launching a legal ambush against China, which is totally unprepared, totally caught off guard, you have a preordained outcome. Once China made this easy mistake, it's an elementary mistake, but it is, it is a mistake that's easy to make. The case is preordained. China is not going to comply with the decision of the case. So for the Philippine side, could you say that they win the battle but lose the war? Maybe, I, but it's just a point that I think it's worth uh, pondering. On the awards, the jurisdiction of the tribunal, I think Clive has covered it quite well, and I don't really have much to add. But let me just say one thing here. And this is the thing which the Chinese case or the Chinese perspective are brought to the forefront. The power to determine the court's own jurisdiction, the competence de la competence, that's without controversy. It's written in the treaty. But the question that the Chinese brought up is this. What if you have an international court or tribunal that against all odds, against all notions of international law, did make a decision in excess of its power. What, 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 what do you do? The decision is binding, without appeal, right? According to UNCLOS. But what if a court did do that? I mean, I'm, a, I'm a law professor, I'm, I like to use hypotheticals. What if, in this case, the tribunal did say, we have the power to decide on territorial sovereignty, and we, ha we find that Itu Aba belong to the Philippines? Now, of course, it's not plausible. It's, why would the court do that? But just as a hypothetical, what would China or any country in China's place, what would you do? Now, I would suggest there are a few things that China could do. Uh, in fact, some of these avenues are still open to China. China could go to the General Assembly, and you can mobilize the political process, getting the General Assembly pass a resolution to condemn the award of the tribunal. That's, that's, an open, that's open to China. It's open to China uh, uh, still now. Uh, you might also, and I think that's probably more difficult, you might also persuade the General Assembly to ask for an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice uh, on this particular, on the issue of jurisdiction. Now again, I think technically it's probably difficult. The ICJ probably would find the case inadmissible, but, but it's, it's an idea, it's, it's a suggestion. Let me move on to the merits. Merit, on the merits award, the remarkable thing is that China's response so far has focused on the jurisdictional issues. China has been so far quite muted in terms of the merits award. I mean, in a sense, it's, it's understandable. It's just three months, less than three months since the, award, the merits award uh, was issued. China probably, I mean, they, they, it probably takes a, a longer while uh, for China to fully study and appreciate and digest the whole award. So maybe something is in the pipeline. Maybe China is going to issue a white paper down the road. We do not know. But so far, the response has been uh, muted. Uh, how much of a precedential value this award would have? Could this become a legal precedent in the future? I think it very much depends on the, the development in state practice and the development of uh, international courts and tribunals in future cases. So we, we shall wait and see. In terms of non-compliance, of course China now has said that we are not going to comply with the award. Uh, if we look at the history of non-appearance and non-compliance in international law, if history can teach us any, anything, actually we see that in most cases, even cases of non-appearance where, where the respondent state refuses to appear, in the end, the losing state is going to comply with the judgment or the award in some ways, more or less. So is that going to be repeated in the South China Sea case? Of course, we have to wait and see. But one thing that I think is somewhat encouraging, but of course, it's still just three months. We still have to wait and see. But one thing that seems to be encouraging is that in the past three months, Chinese government, 
as far as I, as far as I know, has not really mentioned the, the nine dash line or the, or the dotted line in its official statement. The last time I think this concept was mentioned in the Chinese official communication was the government uh, statement uh, immediately in the wake of the arbitral award. Now that statement, I'm sure, was prepared in advance. Uh, you have a 500-page document. How can you study the document and make a response in two days? But th that was the last time when the Chinese government mentioned the dotted line. All right? uh, and since then, uh, there has not been an official mention of that. Now, does that mean we already have an obituary to this dotted line concept? Or will, down the road, the, the Chinese government would, uh, would refashion some theories to support this, this idea? We shall wait and see. Uh, uh, the second uh, uh, aspect that I want to mention here is that beyond the, the, the arbitral award, uh, an important uh, uh, issue regarding the role of the arbitral award in the future uh, uh, management and, and, and hopefully resolution of the conflict in the South China Sea depends uh, on China's uh, uh, attitude towards a rule-based world order in general. And here, let me just uh, uh, do a quick analysis here. There are factors that are for and against China's increased or more positive engagement uh, with the international uh, legal order. Let me first talk about the positive factors. What are the factors for? Well, uh, there are some factors that are well documented, I'm, and I'm not going to uh, go through them uh, in any detail. Well, first of all, the reform and opening up policy, uh, which Deng Xiaoping initiated in the late 1970s, that is now part of Chinese Communist Party orthodox. Uh, it's part of the national consciousness of China. So. China is not going to walk away from the reform and open up uh, a process, and that is good news if you are hoping for China's further engagement with the international law. Uh, secondly, uh, China is the major beneficiary of the existing international legal order, so uh, why uh, walk away from it? That's the second factor. Thirdly, the domestic constituency. From uh, business elites to emerging middle class, Chinese people are now traveling, they are studying, they are uh, engaging with the outside world. People are starting to develop a global outlook. People know what is going on in the international community. That all points to a, uh, a, uh, a better uh, prospect for international uh, legal engagement for China. But let me just point uh, to one thing, which I don't think has been uh, uh, fully co uh, covered in the international literature so far. Uh, this is the idea of the Invisible College of International Lawyers. And for those, for those of you who are not international law experts, let me just uh, quickly explain this, this concept. Uh, the idea, I think, was first uh, coined by uh, Professor Oscar Schachter in, uh, of Columbia Law School almost 50 years ago. And the idea is this, basically. Uh, when you talk about lawyers in different countries, commercial lawyers, criminal lawyers, they have difficulty in communicating with each other but because the concepts, the methods are different. But international lawyers, whether you're from Japan, you're from China, you're from uh, South Africa or Brazil, we basically read the same books. We read the same cases, same materials. We more or less have the same commitment to international rule of law, so we can communicate quite easily. And the role of the community of international lawyers often is a positive one. It usually uh, uh, co causes the national governments, more or less, uh, to engage more in the international legal process. Now, the Invisible College of International Lawyers in China, what is the international law community in China like? Well, for one thing, uh, since the reform and open up process started in the late 1970s, we now have a new generation of international lawyers in China uh, who are technically uh, quite competent. There's a great deal of technical expertise uh, in many uh, members of the international uh, law community uh, in China. Uh, and uh, in fact, the international lawyers in China who work in the government or who work in the academia have been, I think, playing a quite active role in pushing for China's engagement with the international uh, legal process. Uh, th this is one thing that I think has not been mentioned so far. Up until February 2013, when China made this non-appearance decision, up until that moment, there had been actually a positive trajectory for China to further engage in the international legal process. Uh, in the about 10 years, in the decade preceding that, that unfortunate moment, China joined the WTO in 2001. And China has been participating, I think, uh, up to today, almost 50 cases before the WTO dispute settlement body. China lost most of them, but China is gaining experience. Uh, China uh, 
proactively participated in the advisory proceedings before the International Court of Justice and also in the ITLOS. Uh, China, uh, Chinese government actually participated in many foreign legal proceedings uh, in defense of Chinese interests, including cases here in Australia. So what we saw was a, uh, a, a trend, a positive trend of China moving uh, uh, more into integration with, uh, with the international uh, legal process. And now we suddenly, in February 2013, we have the Philippine uh, uh, case. And that is, I think, very unfortunate. It bucked the trend of this very positive development uh, in China. Now, factors against. What are the factors that would, move, that would work against China? Again, uh, many of these factors are very well documented in the literature. I'm not going into details. Uh, first of all, China still does not, have in that, uh, does not have adequate expertise. The tribunal in the merits award says China's expansionist policy in South China Sea probably is because of its misunderstanding, quote unquote, misunderstanding of its rights and obligations under the UNCLOS. Uh, well, I think that's not the full picture, but that probably accounts partly for what is going on in China. There are some very good, very top international lawyers in China, but by and large, qualified international lawyers who can really engage with the international legal uh, community is still few and far apart. It's, it's just not, not, too, not adequate. Uh, secondly, there is this uh, cynicism with international law. Cynicism with international law. Uh, there are a couple of things that can be mentioned. Lack of rule of law tradition. China does not have rule of law. China does not have jud judicial independence. Many people in China find it difficult that there could be such a thing as an independent court. Uh, of course, in China, courts are often open for sale. Uh, you can always buy a judge. So, uh, uh, so people really have difficulty in, in having faith in a process that is uh, that is independent and neutral, that the politicians cannot interfere with directly. That rule of law concept is still sorely missing uh, uh, in, in China's uh, legal community. Uh, there is a widespread instrumentalist notion of law. Uh, so people say, all right, everything is political. So what is, well, of course everything is political in a sense, but again, as I said, there is such a process in reality which is designed to be independent and neutral, which the politicians cannot interfere with directly. There is still such a thing, even though you can say every, everything is political. Uh, the rivalry of, for hegemony between, uh, with the United States. Well, in the presidential debate, Hillary asked uh, 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 Trump, uh, are you going to blame me for everything that is bad that happens to the United States? Well, if Hillary should be elected, I think Hillary might ask the Chinese the same question. Are you going to blame me for everything that, ha that, that is bad uh, that happens to, to China? And I think many Chinese conservative thinkers would say, yes, we do blame you for every misfortune that befalls China. Uh, so it, they, this conspiracy theory is widespread, uh, and, and it's, it's most un uh, unfortunate. Censorship. Uh, Discussion of international political and international legal issues are very much sens uh, censored, uh, uh, and I think that's very well documented. I do not need to go any further. Nationalism, the nationalism is still the, I think, the most deep-rooted, most dynamic, and the most dangerous uh, uh, element that uh, uh, obstructs, that frustrates China's further integration uh, into the international community. Uh, now, I, I think most of us. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think most of us know that uh, uh, nationalism is the source of political legitimacy for the Communist Party nowadays. Nationalism is state-sponsored, and uh, we have this century of humiliation uh, a narrative in China. Although I actually quite, uh, I actually do not think this narrative plays a big role in China's uh, foreign policy uh, uh, making. Uh, there's also, uh, on the other hand, nationalism is uh, has a fundamentally destabilizing nature, so the Chinese government really need to manage nationalism. Uh, just uh, to conclude, the last thing. In the wake of the, uh, the South China Sea arbitration, uh, the Chinese government uh, is uh, making an attempt to refashion uh, its uh, claim uh, in the South China Sea based on a historical and a legal discourse. And here, I just want to emphasize the importance of history in China's perspectives on on South China Sea in general and on the international legal issues uh, relating to uh, 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 South China Sea. And uh, uh, now, the Chinese people, uh, from school children uh, to the government white papers, Chinese people are always constantly and without any dissenting opinion are fed with this, this narrative of history, that, that history is on the side of China, that, that historical justice 
uh, 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 supports China, uh, and 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 people uh, are not uh, given the idea that actually ma m many, if not most, of China's historical claims in South China Sea uh, is uh, controversial. Uh, it is the same thing in, in, in the legal field. The Chinese public is being told repeatedly that China actually uh, uh, is supported by international law. So what I think we, uh, need to happen in terms of counterbalance nationalism, in terms of winning the minds of the Chinese public, uh, is that we need to have a dialogue, uh, on the one hand, uh, to show uh, the lack of support in international law of Chinese position, and more importantly, to debunk uh, the uh, what I call the historicity of the Chinese claims to South China Sea, and to unmask uh, the facts and the myths uh, about the uh, the history and the histori historiography uh, about South China Sea. I, I don't know if there is really such a thing as historical truth. Who knows what happens 1,000 years ago in South China Sea? Uh, but it is important that we should have a rational and evidence-based process to educate and further to persuade the Chinese international law community and the Chinese public uh, as to the merits of uh, the South China Sea conflict. So we need to have a rational and evidence-based uh, uh, process. So to my American colleagues here, please do not elect Donald Trump. Thank you. <laughs>